Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Please stand and join us. You are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my heart. You are the truth and the way. You are the light and the dark. Stone, we are continuing our series in Galatians, so you can turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Let me give you just a little bit of a background uh, in case uh, you're just coming in halfway through our series here so that you kind of get the, the heart of where Paul is coming from as we continue uh, our study today. Uh, we began by explaining that Paul was on his first missionary journey. He planted several churches uh, in the Roman province of Galatia. And as he moved on from that, what was happening is Judaizers were coming in behind him, visiting those churches and preaching. Uh, there's an addition, there's an amendment to the gospel that Paul forgot about when he was here. So, so Paul's gospel was very clearly Christ alone. It, Jesus plus nothing saves. That's the gospel. The Judaizers were coming in behind him and saying, well, almost... It's, it's, it's Jesus plus it, you need to become a Jew. You need to come into our, our Jewish community and, and conform to our, our ways of doing things so that you can have the blessings of Abraham. And as you do, your salvation will be complete. And the Galatians were buying it. And Paul is furious. Uh, so he's, he's addressing the Galatians on this issue. Now that's a very specific issue. Probably not a lot of us are, are being tempted to come and join the Jewish nation to complete our salvation. However, the Jesus plus something gospel, uh, that, that has never gone away. We are always tempted to 
add something to the gospel. And we need to, through this series, make sure that we understand that the gospel that we are now seeking and being influenced by and have responded to is Jesus plus nothing, and that never changes in our walk with Christ. It's never more than Jesus plus nothing. So Paul starts this out in chapter 1 in in verse 6, and and Paul gets right on the Galatians. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who brought you under the grace of Christ, and you're turning to another gospel. And he says in the next verse, another gospel is no gospel at all. If you are depending on anything outside of Jesus alone for your salvation, you are hoping in a false gospel. And that's why Paul is coming down so hard on the Galatians. In verse 10, we spent some time talking about the importance that we live as Christ followers to please God alone. Uh, Paul said, if I were trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. The two are not compatible. You are either a people pleaser or a God pleaser, but you cannot do both at the same time. God calls us to live as Christians before Him alone, not to worry about the opinions and thoughts of others, but God is our judge and we live to please Him alone. So Paul spent some time on that. Quit quit trying to impress these Judaizers uh, by conforming to their doctrines and and live before what you know is right in Christ alone. He affirms in chapter 2 that uh, he says, yet we know that our our justification, our salvation is not in in works of the law, but through Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ. Again, Paul over and over and over is going to be contrasting works in the law versus faith in Christ. What kind of Christian are we going to be? He says at the end of chapter uh, 2, verse 20, uh, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. So Paul is saying this is what a spirit-filled life looks like. I don't have my scroll ready and handy with all the laws that I need to get through my day. Christ is living through me. I am so connected, so identified in my relationship with Jesus Christ that I do not need to live by the law. I am living by the Spirit. That's the call that we have uh, as as Christians, to be Spirit-led Christians. Chapter 3, the beginning there, especially verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish after having begun in the Spirit? Are you now trying to perfect yourself through the flesh? Over and over and over, we see the theme in Galatians is stop trying to live, Christians, through the power of the flesh. Stop trying harder in your Christian life and submit to the Spirit and let Christ live through you. This is the theme. It starts in the gospel and we carry it until Christ calls us home. So knowing that all this is true, seeing that Paul is putting so much emphasis on the gospel and Christ alone and Spirit-empowered living it begs the question, what purpose does the law have? We spoke last week and we, and, and we reminded, uh, we, we taught here that, that salvation always has been, is today, always will be in Christ alone. In the Old Testament, people look forward to the promised Messiah with what information they had been given from God. We are in a blessed time because we can look back with perfect clarity into the mystery of the gospel and see exactly what it is that we're putting our faith in. Christ's sacrificial death on the cross that atones for our sin. So, so knowing that Christ, knowing that our salvation is in Christ alone, what, what, is, what role does the law have anymore? Is it important? Does it even serve a purpose? We know that it's not, uh, it, it's not what saves us. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Nothing about the law. Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ. Nothing to do about the law. Everything is faith in Christ. So why do we have the law? I'm glad you asked because that's exactly how the Apostle Paul starts in verse 19. So let's, let's figure this out. Why then the law? Why do we have the law? It was added because of transgressions. It was added because of our sinfulness. The, the first purpose that God gave us the law is because we are sinners. At my refrigerator at home, uh, I have a piece of paper that says, Daddy's Rules. There's three rules underneath it. Rule number one, be respectful. Rule number two, no interrupting. Rule number three, obey the first time. Now those rules weren't posted at random. 
I have little rule breakers running all around the house. And they really struggle with those. So I wrote them down. Even though they can't read, I help them out so that they understand what the rules are. Well, God gives us the law because we're breaking the rules. We're breaking the law. So he reveals the law to us to show us, hey, hey, you are breaking the law. These are my expectations. Stop doing that. Number two, it is to, to show us our need for grace and mercy. Now, this one's important because once God revealed his law to us, there's something that people quickly understood. I can't keep this. I'm failing at this. This isn't working. I can't keep all these laws. In fact, we could just narrow it down to the Ten Commandments. It's impossible. No one can live up to these standards, which is the point, church. That's the point. The law points us to the reality that we need God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. The law brings us to a point where we come before God and say, God, if, if you don't just extend favor and mercy and grace to me, I am sunk. There's nothing I can do. Jesus calls this being poor in spirit in Matthew 5, 3. When we come to the realization that there is nothing in us that will get us into the presence of God, there is nothing in us that we have to offer that will help us get to heaven. That's bankruptcy spiritually. We have nothing to offer God. And that is why we have the law to help us understand we don't have a shot. Now, I want to help you understand something, church. We have a, uh, an attack in America against the law of God. We have the ACLU. Uh, we have um, uh, the Freedom From uh, Religion Foundation. Uh, organizations like this make sure that no one has the traumatic experience of accidentally walking up to the law of God and reading that and seeing that they fall short of God's expectations. It's been stripped from our courthouses. It's been stripped from our schools. It's been taken out of the public square. No law. No, not, we, we can't have the Ten Commandments out. That's a violation uh, of our, our, our rights here as, as Americans. That's very interesting. See, the Apostle Paul tells us and reminds us in something that we need to see through this, Christians, that we battle not, not against flesh and blood. We battle against principalities and powers uh, we, we, we battle against an enemy that is beyond people. And what Satan understands is that the law exposes our need for grace and mercy found only at the cross through Jesus Christ. The function of the law, church, is to point us to Christ, to show us our need for Him. There is a reason it's being stripped from the land. It, it is part of, of the, the spiritual battle that we are in that we would not see our need for Jesus Christ. The law plays that instrumental role. If you do not have the law, you do not realize how far you, you fall from the expectations of God. And what happens where the, the law is meant to humble us? I can never keep this. I can never measure up to God's ex expectations. What am I supposed to do with this? When we remove the law, what happens is we become proud. I'm a good person. I, I'm not as bad as my neighbor over here. All right, I, I think God would accept me. All we hear in our culture is God is love. God is love. He'll accept me as I am. So I've got it made. I, if I'm a good person, when I go to heaven, uh, when I die, I think I'll go to heaven. I think, I'll, I think God will really like me. And the problem is, is we, we have not been exposed to the law of God who says you need to understand just how far short you fall from my glory and expectations. It's way down there. You're not almost making it if you can just be good enough. You're nowhere close. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The book of James teaches us that to offend the law in one point is to break them all. How, how much does it take to sever you from the love of God, to sever you out of the relationship of an eternity with God, to sever you uh, from being able to spend eternity in heaven one one slip up. Why? Because God is perfect and holy and just in every way. How many sin? How much sin is in heaven? None. They can't let one sin, or it would change heaven. It only took one sin to make this earth into what it is today, to bring the curse upon it. No sin is allowed in heaven. Now, there's there's something neat that happened uh, here this week. Met a 
met a precious uh, woman who stopped in. You know, as we are engaged in the, in the gospel church, it, it is a battle. And sometimes you have so, God lay someone on your heart, and it's, it's a war back and forth. It's a, it's a matter of, of, of trying to uh, communicate to them God's love for them, yet the expectation of we have to deal with sin and how all of this works. And it, it can be quite a challenge with some people. And, and there are other times when God just walks up and, 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 and someone is just so overripe for the gospel, they're on a silver platter. Well, I had that privilege this week. Someone walked into my office, and, and this, is, this was their words. You just, just listen to the spiritual truth in, in what they're trying to express. They said, Pastor, I felt like God, I, God has been with me my whole life. There's times where I should have died. There's times when this should have happened, that should have happened, and I can see the presence of God. He has been with me my whole life. And at the same time, I feel empty. I feel disconnected from Him. Something's wrong. And I know that there's things that, have, that I've done in my life, and she listed this one and this one and this one, and, and, and I've messed up so bad. And I know now that there's this disconnect and there's this hole in me, my heart, and I, I just feel so empty. Pastor, what do I do? I'm glad that you asked. You came to the right place. It, it was my joy to share with her, God has made the provision. What you have, what you have explained is extremely accurate. Yes, God loves you, His presence, He has been with you, but he is, he, you are not saved, you have not been delivered from your sins. So even though you see the presence of God in your life, you have an emptiness inside you. There is a disconnect. He feels distant from you. And as you are longing to figure out what it is you need to do to fill the hole, uh, do I have to be baptized, she asked. No, that's not the key. That's not what's going to fill the hole. That's not what's going to close the gap. It is, well, it, it is what, church? It's faith in Christ alone. That's it. And she gladly made that step. And, and, and I'm super excited for her and hope to, uh, to be able to introduce to you, her, her, you to her at some point here. But we have people that, that understand, that can feel the weight, the separation. And, and that, is, that is the message of the gospel. And the law helps us to understand that. The law tells us you fall short. There is something that we can do. There is something that God has done to bridge the gap. All right, let's, let's continue on here. So why the law? It's been added because of transgressions. Until the offspring, which verse 16 tells us who that is, right? The offspring is Jesus Christ, the offspring of Abraham, should come to, could, should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. I'll be honest with you, church, that one made me scratch my head a little bit. That, that one, um, uh, I, I had to figure out a little bit what, what Paul, where Paul was going here. So let's back up and remember what the big context is here. Paul, over and over, is saying that grace, faith, is superior to the law. Over and over he's doing that. So now he's talking about the way that faith came through a promise to Abraham. It was directly from God to Abraham. You remember the covenant that he made, and God took on all the responsibility Abraham laid asleep and God passed through and made the covenant. It all rested on him. So the promise was made directly to Abraham 430 years before the law ever came. Paul's already made the case that that's why grace and faith are superior to the law. Now he comes in and he says, also, when the law was given, there was an intermediary, a mediator, Moses. All right, there was, there was Moses. So you had God giving the law to Moses and then Moses taking the law to the people. And apparently angels were involved according to what we have here. And, and uh, I would say Deuteronomy 33, 2, if you want to just jot that in your margin, I'll read that to you. That's the only place I see in the Old Testament that, that hints at this. And I'll, I'll read this to you. Deuteronomy 33, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai, this is when he received the law, and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. So as Moses is, is doing this final benediction, this prayer of blessing over the people of Israel before he dies, he's recalling when he received the law on Mount Sinai, and here he remembers uh, ten thousand flaming angels involved in the process. 
I, I can't teach much more where the Bible just whispers. But here Paul is also saying, look, there were angels involved here. Moses was the mediator. It was then given to the people. Uh, this process shows that it's inferior compared to God speaking directly to Abraham with a promise. So, so that's, that's what we, we see going on here. Paul's trying to make this point. You know, by the way, while we're here, you know who was the greatest sinner in all the Bible, don't you? It was Moses. You know why? He broke all Ten Commandments at the same time. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Tough crowd here this morning. Let's move on. Verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would be indeed by the law. There's, there's no command in all the law that we can keep that grants us life. You cannot receive eternal life through the law. It's impossible. Verse 22, But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Again, what's the gospel's focus? What's the point? What's its role? What's its purpose? To point us to Jesus Christ, where we find faith and mercy and grace. These are the things that we need to find for eternal life. Let's move on to the next section. We're going to talk about an illustration now where Paul tries to bring to life the relationship that we share with the law in, in the age that we now live in. Verse 23. Now before faith came, he's talking about Christ, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian. Uh, your version may say the schoolmaster until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So let me pause at verse 24 right there. What is he talking about, this guardian? In, in ancient Roman culture, ancient Greek culture, the well-to-do, the rich, would employ a slave, a wise slave, an experienced slave, to come and, and be a guardian to their young sons. So what this slave would do is he would be given authority over that young man, and he would train him, he would school him, he would tutor him, and, and if necessary, he would discipline him. He was given full jurisdiction to, to invest in this young man's life, and he was given full authority to do so up to a per certain point. Once that young man became a, an adult, that relationship would change from guardian to friend. Now, when, when Paul is talking about this, every Galatian would have recognized that word guardian they knew what that was and they knew what the function was it was a temporary function at a temporary purpose that was to lead them into adulthood so so here's paul's point the law is our guardian that points us to christ that's the that's the it has a temporary purpose now its purpose is to help us see our need for jesus christ Again, and I want to emphasize this, this is why we see the systematic removal of God's law from our society. It, it, it is a strategic move of our enemy to help uh, eliminate the source where people see their need for grace in Jesus Christ through the law. Verse 25, let's continue. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let me pause right there. Baptism. Let's, let's talk about that just for a moment. What, what was baptism's purpose then? Because it's the same now. It was, it was a Christian's identification. It does not save you. But it is your identification in Christ. You know, it really was more common in, in the first century uh, that, that you would see someone give their life to Christ, and immediately they would be baptized. Now, we have some challenges here at Cornerstone uh, because we don't have a, a baptistry yet. One day we will have a baptistry, but right now we're, we're somewhat limited. So we, we baptize about three, four times a year as, as the need grows. However, what we need to understand is, is during this time, when people were turning to Christ, it was immediate. Why? Because it was your identification. It was your public proclamation as a follower of Christ. 
You, you believed, you confessed with your mouth, I believe that Jesus died on that cross for my sin. I believe he rose again. Uh, I believe that he has taken my sin and washed that away. And I've received him by faith. He is now my Lord and my master. I will live for him. The very first thing I will do now is publicly demonstrate that I belong to Christ. And that's what a baptism does. And, and that's why when we baptize, uh, what, what our people say when they're getting baptized is I confess uh, that I belong to Jesus Christ. I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. It's an identification. And of course, it demonstrates uh, the burial, death, burial, and resurrection that we take with Christ. We share in all of those. So it's an identification. I want to challenge Christians who may be here this morning who have been saved. They've placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Yet, there's a disconnect. Perhaps it's been months. Perhaps it's been years. For some of us, perhaps it's been decades, and still no baptism. We've, we've, had that, we've had that change of the heart, but we have not followed through in obedience and baptism. I want to encourage you, don't take your identification in Christ lightly. That's a very serious thing. It's not what saves you, but it is what identifies you as belonging to Christ, and it's something that we need to do in a public fashion. So if you've never done that, we have options for you here at Cornerstone that we want you to be a part of. We want you to take part in this. You can call the office. Uh, you can fill out on a, a, your uh, worship folder right now. There's a little place on there that says, I would like more information about being baptized. Uh, whatever the issue is, we want to help you do that because it's extremely important that we publicly identify ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ. It's just a natural thing to do. All right, as uh, so, so as, as you're pondering that, if you've never done that, I, I hope that you will make the efforts to, to do that in your life because it honors God. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Okay, so once we, we, once we become identified with Christ, hear me on this, church, because it's important. You are a disciple of Christ before you are anything else. I'm not an American who's also a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Christ who has that nationality. I am a husband and a father, but before I am those things, I am a follower of Christ. See, see being a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, doesn't erase all of those things but it puts them in a distant, far second. Above all things, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a pastor, as my profession and calling, that, that pales in comparison to my identification in Jesus Christ. As with every single one of you, if you've identified with Jesus Christ, how, how do you see, if someone asked you to identify yourself, how would you do that? Would Christ be first on the list? See, the, it's going to shape your perspective with how you identify yourself. Well, I'm a father. Well, I'm, I, I'm the provider of my family. I, uh, I, I'm a full-time worker. Well, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm an educator. Uh, you, we can be all of those things, but they can never come first in our list of identification. We are first disciples of Christ, and on a far second, third, fourth, fifth come those things. And if we do that, we're going to keep our walk much more straight with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to help stop idols uh, from creeping into our lives. Let's continue on. <clears throat> Verse, uh, chapter 4, we're going to hit the last seven, uh, the first seven verses in this chapter, and then we'll be finished with this. Because we're, we're going somewhere with this. The law, well, what is the purpose of the law? Why then the law? It points us to Christ. It shows us our, that we fall short of God's expectations. When it brings us through to full fruition and we are now a part of Christ, Chapter 4 explains what happens. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now, this is important for us to understand. Before you come to Christ, you are enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Money, money power, sex, these types of things that, that get sunk into us so deeply that not only do we struggle in those areas, we are enslaved to those areas. We, we will not be able to break free out of our own power. That's what enslaved means. So it's different for each of us. 
But our culture is very tied up in, in those basic three, money, sex, and power. It could be something different for you. But when it gets its claws deep into you, it wraps you in chains, and you simply cannot break free. And it becomes a driving force in your life. Christ comes to set us free from that. Christ comes to break those chains. Uh, God is not satisfied leaving us in, in our slavery. In fact, not only is he not satisfied in his heart, he has adoption on his mind. Listen to this, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Anyone in here ever adopted? Wow, look at those hands. Some of you have been adopted. Some of you are adopted. Yep. Lots of you. That's awesome. Well, let me, number one, let me say thank you because that is one of the most profound ways of demonstrating the reality of the love of Christ that a Christian family could possibly have. Now, adoption is not for ev any, everyone, but man, anyone who would consider that, I, I think it's one of the most beautiful pictures we can, we can live out uh, as, a, as a family of Christ. So, so thank you for those of you who have adopted uh, and, and gone through that process. Now, I will say, I've talked to some people I have not adopted. I've talked to some people who have. It does not sound to me like that's a process for the faint of heart. You are deeply invested in getting that child. There is work, there is time, there is energy, there is money, there is red tape, there is confusion, there's complications, there's setbacks, there's frustrations. Uh, am I close? Yeah. But your heart is set on adoption, and you will stop at nothing until that child is in your family and belongs to you. Right? That's where God is. That's where His heart is. And, and let me tell you something. God's process of adoption is a whole lot more invested than yours. God's process of adoption involved Him trading His firstborn so that He could have you and His family. Now, I want you to picture this just for a moment. What if parents who have adopted, what if the requirement for you to get that child was your firstborn? Are you still interested in adopting? I'm going to tell you that I couldn't do it. I, I, I have a, my oldest is Sadie, five years old. I couldn't give her up for anything. I love her too much. There's nothing in this world that I would trade Sadie for. And I want you to understand, Cornerstone, that God's love for you was so deep and we are so unable to fathom the depth of his love for us that he did just that. He gave up his firstborn to be crucified on a cross to pour his wrath out to deal with our sin. All this happened because his heart was set on adopting you and nothing was going to stop him. He saw that we were left in a desperate place and that we could do nothing to save ourselves and there was not any price God was not willing to pay to bring us in back into his family. Can you fathom that? Can you fathom giving up your firstborn for another child? We, we can't. We, in our humanity, our minds cannot even comprehend that. Yet God's love went that far. The process was that involved and God followed through. I'm, I've been adopted into God's family because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. I can't fathom that. I really can't. How much God must love me. And yet sometimes people will not respond. They will not come to God. They will not respond to the, the gospel because they think, I've offended God too deeply. There's no way that God can still love me. You have no comprehension of how much God loves you. The sacrifice has already been made. He is willing to forgive any level of sin and wickedness that has been demonstrated and acted out in our lives. He loves you as his son, as his daughter, just as you are. And he is ready to wash you clean with the blood of Christ. And there's some who struggle. Well, can the blood of Christ wash away this mess? You don't know how bad I've messed up, preacher. You don't know how deep my sin goes. Not nearly as deep as the blood of Christ. Not even close. Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds further still. And you are not the exception. There are no exceptions in this room. God's power is so far beyond that. 
This is where our faith comes in. Where we can't fathom that level of love, we must receive it by faith because God says it is so. When we can't fathom that level of forgiveness, we must receive it by faith because God says in His Word that it is so. He redeems those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, in verse 6, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God seals us with His Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God who is in you, by whom you have been saved by the day of redemption. God seals you as His own. When you cry out to Him, He puts a mark on you, a spiritual tattoo. It's the Holy Spirit, the seal of the Spirit. That never goes away. God has no orphans in heaven. Once He adopts, He keeps you. He is faithful to the end. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And and then then He says this, We cry, Abba, Father. Now, all God's children have a very distinct sound. I was in the mall a couple weeks ago with Mandy. Had a couple kids at one end of the mall. She was at the other end of the mall. And all of a sudden, I heard a baby crying. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I recognize that baby's cry. I know who that is. It was my son, Skylar. I've, I've heard it enough that I know exactly my ear tunes right in. I can hear in the nursery, there could be six babies crying. I know when it's Skylar. I recognize his voice. God recognizes the voice of His children when they cry out, Abba, Father. Now, where have we heard Abba, Father before? That was expressed at the Garden of Gethsemane. It's it's a term of of intimacy, of, of dependence. And Jesus demonstrated that right before the cross. And He said, oh, Father, if this cup can pass from me, I don't want to be crucified. I don't want to bear the sins of the world. I'm scared of that in my humanity, in my flesh. But God, whatever you choose for me, your will be done and not mine. That was the cry, Abba, Father. How do you respond when the trial comes? The waves come crashing in. You've got more on your shoulders than you can bear. Because God's children cry out, Abba, Father. I I can't do this on my own, God. I need you, God. Like never before, I know you can help me in this situation. You must come here because without you I can't make it. That's the cry of Abba Father. I'll tell you what uh, God's, uh, those who are walking in right relationship with God do not do when the pressure gets too hard and the waves come crashing in, the walls are, are, are closing in on you. They don't stand up and curse God. God, how could you let this happen to me? How dare you? You say you love me, and look what's happening in my life. You don't love me. That's not the cry of Abba Father. We have to be very careful that we don't curse the day we were born. We don't curse God. We don't curse our circumstances. When trial comes dumping down on us, and it's more than we can take, those who are in genuine, right relationship with God call out to God. Another word for Abba Father is Daddy. It's that kind of intimate call. Dad, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I was, talking with a, I was talking with a young man in the jail just the other day. And we have several people that work in the jail down there at Clarion County. And those people mean a lot to us. We've got the gospel of Christ that can break the chains that many of them struggle with because we've struggled with them and we've seen it work in our lives. So the more difficult questions and cases get, get put on my plate. And I have, it's an honor to go over there and talk to those people spoke to a young man this last week, and uh, that's what happened. Or I asked him directly, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian, but I've got some questions for God. And he went on to say, this has happened in my life, and this has happened, and you know what? If God knew I was going to make these choices that would land me here, isn't it partly his fault too? <laughs> I said, well, you know what? I've got a verse for you. Proverbs 19.3. Proverbs 19.3 says, uh, when a man's folly bring his way to ruin, yet his heart rages against the Lord. You know what that means? We make the stupid decisions, and then we turn and we point our finger at God like it's his fault. We can't do that. We can't do that. And that's what he was doing. That's what many of us do. And you know what? That's not the cry of Abba Father. This is your fault, God. No, our sufferings will test our faith. 
And the cries that go up and reaches the Father's ear will determine where we stand with Him in relationship. Are we adopted sons and daughters? Or are we just wearing the Jesus patch so that things, if they get too tough, we can have that, that lucky charm there? We've got to be careful. This is a, when we come to Christ through faith, you've got to remember, that's, that's not a simple call that just says, now I'm going to love on you. That's God saying, you're going to die to yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross, and live for me and nothing else. It's a radical call to faith. It's life-changing. It's not just something you add to your life. It, it, it completely turns your life around. Your worldview, all your views are now funneled through the Word of God and now, just as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, it's Christ living through me. John Green is no more. He has been slain, crucified with Christ, buried, and now Christ is risen in him and lives through him. It's the call I share and and the call that you share if you identify with Jesus Christ, if you have responded to the gospel and you're coming through the cross. That's the call of the gospel. It's not an easy believism. It is a surrendering of your life to God completely and wholly to where He is your Master and your Lord, and it is His will that is done, not your own. That's why it's so important that we identify ourselves first above anything else as a disciple of Christ. So because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. We are an heir. Eternal life now belongs to our inheritance. The mansion that Jesus is preparing for us that he spoke of in the book of John. All this becomes our inheritance. The law points us to this from the very beginning. What's the purpose of the law? To point us to Christ who will deliver us from our slavery to this world and make us not a slave but a son and an heir adopted into the family of God. The law still has an important role to play. It doesn't drive us from day to day. That's what Christ does. That's what the Spirit does. We desire to be a Spirit-empowered people. Do we not, Cornerstone? Okay, it's the law that brought us there. But just like the guardian to the ancient Roman uh, couple who had a, a son to raise up, when he became an adult, the guardian was no longer had authority over that person but was just a friend. It's in the same way that we we work with the law. The law brings us to Christ and then introduces us to spirit-empowered living, not flesh-empowered living. So let me ask you this morning, if this is the purpose of the law, let's let's subject ourselves to this because maybe you're still thinking out there, well, I still think I've got a good shot at heaven because I'm a pretty good person. I'm just going to give you a couple things in close here. I'm just going to go through some of the Ten Commandments just, just to take a look, the, the first of the Ten Commandments is you shall have no other gods before me. Nothing in your life should come before God. Is that where you stand? Has that always been the case? You have lived your life and nothing has ever been more important to God. And you can prove it by your actions and choices, decisions uh, throughout your life, that, that God has always been first in your life. You, you lost me on this one, I, I'll be honest. I have not always lived that way. I've broken the primary most important first command. And God will hold me accountable for that. Thank God I've come through the cross and been forgiven. How about murder? That one sounds like a really bad one. Sometimes we use the Ten Commandments as, as kind of a safety cushion. Well, at least I haven't murdered anybody. I'm not that bad. But yet, yet Jesus says to be angry in your heart against your brother is to have the spirit of, of murder. And God looks at the heart, not the outward man. And, and Jesus says, if, if you are holding a bitterness and an anger towards your brother, it is though you have murdered. You, are, you will be held guilty for that. Well, okay, let's, let's try something else. How about adultery? That's in the Ten Commandments. I haven't done that one. Or maybe you have. But maybe you're standing there and saying, well, I haven't, and I think I'm a pretty good person because of that. Well, well Jesus says, if, if you even look at a woman and lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And God judges the heart, not the outward actions. Guilty. Guilty. What about lying? Thou, thou shalt not bear false witness. Have you ever lied? Don't add another one to the list. <laughs> You've been there, done that, haven't you? Okay? That's, that's enough right there. To break one is to break them all. Well, surely, surely God is merciful. No, the, the, God is merciful. He has provided a way of escape from the penalty of our sin. 
What about stealing? I mean, we could go on with the Ten Commandments. Uh, the, the, the law is here to show us you and I do not make the cut. We don't make the cut. There's no one in here who has lived up to the expectations and standards of God's righteousness. Only Christ alone. So it is through Christ that we come. It is through Christ our sins are washed away. And it is through Christ we are made acceptable and robed in his righteousness so that we can belong to the family of God. Have you ever done that? Friends here at Cornerstone who are with us this morning, I want to let you know something. God will simply look at you on the day of judgment to see if you bear the righteousness of Christ, if you've come through the cross. That's, that's the judgment. If you have, your sins have been dealt with and there will be no condemnation in Jesus Christ. He will reward you for all that you have done empowered by the Spirit to broaden His kingdom. And in the same breath, if you did not go through the cross, if you have not come through Jesus Christ, if you thought you could be a good enough person, if you thought you just didn't do anything bad enough to deserve God's judgment for all eternity, I'll promise you, if you're missing the righteousness of Christ, God looks at us and says, your righteousness is like filthy rags. They don't impress me. And in the book of Matthew says that we will be held accountable for every word that comes out of our mouth. Yikes. Could you imagine standing before that judgment? That's the great white throne judgment from which heaven and earth flees. It is so terrible. God's desire is that he would deliver you from that judgment, take you through the cross, and heap rewards as a proud father on you because of how Christ lived through you. That's God's design. He's got adoption on the heart. But you have to submit to the process. God will not adopt anyone against their will. Have you been adopted into the family of God? Have you asked God to forgive you of your sins? Are you confident that right where you sit right now, if Jesus were to open up the skies and call his church home, that you'd belong in that group? Do you belong to him? If you were to die today, is your eternity secure and fixed in Christ alone? If not, I, I, just, I, I want to speak this truth to you, friends. God has your adoption on his mind and heart right now. He longs for you. He loves you beyond what you can imagine. But we will do this his way. We can't skirt around the cross. You've got to come through the cross. You've got to humble your heart and acknowledge to God that you are a sinner and that you do not deserve heaven. But you can respond to what Christ has done on the cross, and you can come through that today. If you feel God just kind of knocking on your heart even right now, I want to encourage you. That's something you say yes to. That's something you respond to. When the king of kings says, I want you to be a part of my family, I want you to identify with me, if that's the knock that's happening on your heart, that's something you respond to. You don't be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. So right now, church, I just want us to bow, bow our heads and close our eyes, and I just want to pray right now. And let God do his work in our hearts. Right now, Father, I'm just praying uh, that you would just quiet our minds and our hearts and free us from distractions so that we might concentrate on the call to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith alone. Let each one of us fathom just for a moment, Father, our standing before you as we are judged by the law. Let us see our spiritual bankruptcy, Father. There is nothing we can offer you, but you've done all the work. Through Jesus Christ on the cross, you offer us salvation even now where we sit. Father, I pray that you would convict each heart who is in need of a Savior right now because we don't know how much time we have left. And today is a great day to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. With no one looking around, every eye closed, every head bowed, I'm going to ask you to do something that requires faith and courage. If you need to be saved this morning, if you need to come through the cross, if you need God to forgive you of your sins, with no one looking around but as a step of faith, would you just place your hand in the air? I want to pray for you. I will not point you out or embarrass you, but this is serious stuff. This is your time to respond before God by faith. Yes, God, I need a Savior. Thank you, ma'am. Who else will raise their hand? One already responding, saying, I, I need to do this. I need to have my future secure. Thank you, ma'am. Two women have raised their hands. Who else will join these two women in saying, Pastor, I, I need to settle this right now this morning. I'm in a need 
for a Savior. I need to be forgiven. I do not pass the test that God has given to us in the law. Who else would raise their hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me too? Anyone else? For these two that have raised their hand, God listens to the prayer of the heart. There's no magical formula I can give you. There's, there's no act that you can do that will save you. But God promises that when we cry out from the heart, whoever cries upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If it's your desire right now to respond to what the Lord is doing in your heart, would you just pray a prayer like this, just from your heart? This is an act of faith on your part. Let's, let's pray together. God, I believe that Jesus died for my sin on that cross. I believe, God, that through him, my sins can be forgiven. And right now, I ask you to forgive me of the sin in my life. In this moment, I acknowledge my need for a Savior. And I'm calling out to you, Jesus. By faith, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I will only live for you. Change me from the inside out. Right now where I sit, adopt me into your family. I believe your promise that says when I call out to you, you will save me. So by faith right now, I thank you for saving my soul and adopting me into your family. With no one looking around, if you just prayed that prayer from your heart, would you just acknowledge that? Would you just place your hand in the air for me to see? Thank you, ma'am. We rejoice with you. Thank you, ma'am. We rejoice with you. Thank you. Another young lady, another lady for placing their hands in the air. The Bible says that when one sinner repents and gives their life to the Lord, there's rejoicing among the angels. So there's a celebration happening in heaven that matches the joy we feel right now in this church. Father, right now we give you the glory. We give you thanks for the decisions that have been made in the hearts of these women today. Father, I pray that this would be no shallow decision, but this is a line in the sand that from this day forward they belong to you alone. They live for you alone. They are identified with Christ alone. And because of that, their lives will be forever changed.